All right, people are still coming in a little bit, but I'm going to start. Uh, welcome to my presentation, Forget About Nodes, at the Blender Conference 2024. Uh, I have to put a little bit of an asterisk to that title. It's not exactly uh, the truth. Um, <laughs> it's a little bit clickbait. I'm sorry about that. Um, maybe the talk title should be a little bit more like... Oh. Oh my God. It's very sad. Technical dif difficulties, I apologize. Well, thankfully this version of Blender is still in beta stage, so this can be fixed. But yeah, we're going to be working with Blender 4.3 today. Okay, that's not a good sign. Okay, it's interactive. Okay, at least this happened at the beginning of the talk, so I can just act like nothing happened. <laughs> Welcome to my talk, Forget About Notes. I have to put a little bit of an asterisk to that title. <laughs> <laughs> I clickbaited you a little bit, sorry about that. Maybe the talk title should be a bit more something like... <laughs> <laughs> Wait. I just, I just try to keep going like this. About new nodes in Blender 4.3, especially gizmos, which can kind of make you forget that you're using nodes. So that's kind of the idea. You shouldn't forget about nodes, please don't. Uh, we want to keep improving them and working on them. But the idea is that we want to make more and more tools uh, to allow people to build node systems that can be used independently of the node tree in the 3D viewport by artists that don't even need to necessarily understand that there's nodes driving the whole system, but you can just use the tools as pre-built assets. And we're kind of trying to push that envelope more and more. And with Blender 4.3, there's a new system in place to build custom gizmos that can be shipped alongside node tree assets that people can just use on the fly in the 3D viewport. And that's one of the things that I want to talk about today, uh, alongside some other new features in Blender 4.3, specifically in geometry nodes. So let's hope this isn't frozen anymore and we can keep going. Well, that didn't work. I'm not going to do that first part again. That was a bit much. <laughs> so what even are gizmos? Gizmos are these nice little widgets in your 3D viewport that you can use to interact with the 3D scene to change parameters of the 3D scene uh, directly without putting in values, but just visually by interacting with the 3D viewport. That part should be familiar to you, uh, but how is this actually related to nodes? So the idea with the new gizmo nodes in Blender 4.3 is that you can take, take, um, the inputs of your node tree and manipulate them with nodes in the 3D viewport. So I have an asset here that if I select it, already comes with these two little gizmos. This is just a little uh, low poly tree asset. And I can, in the 3D viewport, interact with it. Also, when I go back here to the main viewport, 
you can see how I can change parameters of this procedural model on the fly visually just by interacting with it. And that's the idea. Uh, so let me go a little bit over how this is done. If I look at the node tree for this asset, this is the entire asset. There's a main chunk of the node tree that actually does the heavy lifting of doing the uh, geometry manipulation and creating this uh, this model of the tree. And then there's here a very small chunk of nodes on the side that defines how to interact with these parameters. And uh, this works by using these individual uh, gizmo nodes here. So I have a linear gizmo node, which is a specific type of gizmo that allows linear interaction. So I'm interacting with it on a certain line to drive my value. There's also other types of gizmos, and in the future there's hopefully going to be more types of gizmos, but let's start with this one for now. Uh, so the way that something in the, view, um, in the node tree is actually driving the values is a little bit different to what we're used to in Blender uh, geometry nodes, where we don't have a direct data flow from left to right, where it's like the gizmo gives you a value that you pass out at the end, is rather the other way around, that whatever goes into this value socket of the gizmo here will be driven kind of backwards. So we have the height group input of the modifier, and that is connected with the linear gizmo, which means that it will be driven. That is also then signified with the little icon that you can see here. So if I cut this line, you can see how it disappears. And that also helps you identify that this value is driven by a gizmo if you, for example, have this uh, just separately somewhere else in the node tree. And also the flow of how this information of changing the value is propagated backwards is also uh, signified with the double line that we can see here. So it can kind of tell that there's a data flow going from the left to the right, but then there's also some sort of new gizmo flow of back propagating the data uh, with that second line. So that's how we're trying to communicate this because the concept is a little bit hard to grasp in the beginning, but you'll see how this, uh, this way of doing it is actually a lot more powerful than it would be the other way around. Because now we can uh, do some fancy things like uh, encapsulating these gizmo nodes in node groups and then just chipping them as, uh, as containers that already contain their own uh, gizmos and then just nesting those in node groups as much as we want and they it just makes sense. It just propagates everything back. So let's look a little bit more in detail at this specific node tree. It's relatively simple. We have the linear gizmo node. It has a couple of options, like we can choose the color that we want to uh, want to use to communicate the functionality. Here I want to uh, set the height of the tree, so I just went for the, the blue color for the z-axis in Blender. And then you can choose a shape. Uh, so there's a couple of pre-built options. Eventually we want to have more options and possibly also custom, uh, custom shapes. But this is for the first version uh, for now where we want to see a little bit what people do with it and where the limits are uh, to, to uh, add incrementally to it. And then I already mentioned that there's this uh, input to actually define what this gizmo drives and also a position input to define where it is in the 3D viewport. And you can see that there's kind of a circular dependency here a little bit where the height, which is driven by the gizmo, is also defining where it is on screen. And that's the kind of thing that is allowed by this kind of setup. Uh, and then the second input that is driven with another gizmo is the, uh, oh yeah, and then the, I kind of skipped over that, the direction of the gizmo is also defined of course, which also defines the direction that the user will interact with it. So that should be aligned to make sense. Uh, and then we have a second input that is driven by another gizmo, which is the branch start, which is kind of a fraction. If I actually look at the values of this modifier here, you can, of course, uh, change the same value without the gizmo, just as you know in the modifier interface. And there you can see it's kind of a fraction of the height, so you don't have to put in a specific number, it just automatically adjusts uh, by having it set up with the multiply node here 
uh, to multiply the height with the branch start. And that already shows us a little bit uh, more uh, complex dependency than just directly driving a value with the gizmo. Instead, we're driving a value that has been multiplied by the height. So if I just mute this node, if I just get rid of this multiplication, then it's a, it's a lot harder to control this because we're not actually controlling the uh, the fraction multiplied with the height. We're just controlling the fraction directly. So it doesn't consider the height of the tree at all. If the tree was huge, then this would be a lot harder to control. So if we actually set this up like this, then geometry nodes will be smart enough to tell, okay, if this gizmo is moved just a little bit, depending on the height, I need to actually change the fraction a certain amount. So it just makes sense and it just works like this. All right, that's a little bit about the theory of how, uh, how this is set up. Let's start with a simple example, like a classic little example of just using a plane. So with that, we just have the grid node, and I'm just going to add some gizmos to this to control the inputs, because by, by itself, the grid node doesn't have any gizmos. It could, but right now it doesn't. So let me just add another linear gizmo. And then how do we control this size? Because we can't just pipe it out of here. So we need to have another value that we actually control. I'm just gonna add a value node. And then connect that both to the gizmo and to the size. Let's just set this back to two. So we can actually see something. And then if I change this value, you can see this also changes the value in real time in the uh, node tree, as you can see, like this. Uh, if I click away, by the way, you can't actually see the gizmo anymore, and that's because it's context dependent, which ones are shown. So if I click on the gizmo node itself or on the value that's being driven, it shows up. If I always want to see this gizmo, which in this case, because I want to actually build the node tree a little bit, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to do, I can just pin this gizmo so it's always shown regardless of what I have selected. And then here you can already see this new line where it goes forward and backward to, in, uh, to inform you about the backwards propagation of the gizmo and the information with it. But now this is not really very useful. It's just a, just a slider from uh, bottom to top, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So if we're controlling the X size, we actually want to have it point into the X direction like this. And ideally it should be attached to the side as well. So let me just create a combine XYZ node, plug this into X, and then that's gonna be my position. But that's not quite right because the plane, the, the grid, is in the uh, is centered around its its own center, so the position of the arrow should be half of uh, of the total size. So we can just use a multiply node in between. Oh, another new feature that's going to be a lifesaver, by the way. To just add nodes to an existing link, it's very nice, very nice. Multiply by 0 0.5, and now it's in the right spot. And see how I already connected this also to the flow of the, uh, the gizmo input. This is also something I'm multiplying by 0 0.5. So we're kind of defining what scale we want to control, which is not just the size itself, but half of it, because that's what it's attached to. And then Blender will just figure out that it needs to uh, it needs to adjust by how much we want to change the size based on that factor. Excuse me, is that a backward question now? Um, you can, if it's like a really important question, you can just ask it now. Otherwise, we can just do it at the end. Okay, at the end. Uh, right. So that's how it works. You can see if I don't do that if I just connect the, uh, the size directly and only do this adjustment for the position, then we click, quickly lose the attachment while we're dragging. It will already snap back into the right spot because we have the position set. But while I'm dragging this gizmo, 
it's not changing it at the correct rate. So there's a disconnect. And that's why we can just connect it like this, and then everything works perfectly. I'll just duplicate this to do this for the same, uh, for the other axis as well. Get another value, multiply by 0.5, plug it into size Y. And then just replace this here, this, and there it is. So that's relatively simple to set up. And you can kind of decide also that you want to have your gizmo node tree a little bit separate from the main flow, so you can make it a little bit more clear uh, what's happening, or you can integrate it a little bit more uh, on, the, on the canvas of the node tree. OK. Now I want to make this a little bit more complicated, just a bit, by having an additional gizmo, also a linear gizmo, that controls both axes at the same time. I want to have a gizmo where I can drag the corner of the plane in a diagonal to just change the overall size as one. And for that, we can actually make use uh, of the fact that this uh, gizmo flow with these uh, with these double lines here can be connected to multiple parameters at the same time. So we can control both the size in the x direction and the size in the y direction at the same time. So let me just plug them in. And then you can see if I change this, it just controls both of them. So we can basically make a setup uh, that's pretty variable with lots of different gizmos that have their own purpose that are controlling the same values in different ways that make sense to what they're representing in 3D. Uh, right. So to, to get the correct position of where this should be, because I want it on the corner here, we can just add the two vectors of the positions of the other ones. Now it's on the corner. And also just use the same direction, uh, same for the direction, because then it just adjusts like this. But now we have the same problem again. It's detached from where it's going. Because we don't want to actually just control both of the uh, sides at the same rate. That only really works when we have a perfect uh, square. If the... Uh, if the grid is like very rectangular, very like slim like this, if I drag this slider here, I want the uh, x-axis to change a lot more drastically than the y-axis. And for that, we just do the same trick with the, uh, with the factors of just multiplying how much we change the individual inputs with the gizmo. And, uh, and to figure out the exact factor for this, we need to do a little bit of trigonometry. I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to sketch this up and uh, explain it in detail. I'm just going to put in the nodes. It's not too complicated. It's just an uh, arc tangent and a sine and a cosine. Like this for the different axes to just get the right fraction between the uh, x and the y dimension of the plane. And I think I can just connect it like this. Just got to make sure I'm not doing it wrong. Oh, that seems wrong. Almost. Ah, my bad. I need to divide <laughs> maths. Looks better. Ah, right. I just connected it to the uh, size itself, but exactly same thing as for the uh, individual ones, we need to use the half size. And there we go, works. So this, this kind of stuff might be a little bit more finicky sometimes, but there really isn't that uh, easy of a way sometimes to do a more complex uh, dependency on the different parameters, but uh, yeah, this way it should be relatively intuitive because you're defining the, uh, the scale of the values that you actually want to control. 
So sometimes you would, might just need to get something figured out, um, and it might just take a little bit. But uh, this this kind of feature set is more intended for people building their own assets that are a little bit more low, uh, low level from the ground up, so that then other people can use the existing gizmos in a way that they just propagate and bubble up all the way to like a like a specialized tool that you can uh, share with other people. Now, let me add another type of gizmo, because so far we've only used the linear gizmo, uh, and that's the transform gizmo. It's a more complex type of gizmo. Oh, that's, a, that's not a transform gizmo, it's a transform geometry node. And it looks like this. This should look pretty much familiar from uh, the transform gizmo that you also get for uh, object manipulation. And uh, you can simply, so this is also using a new, the new matrix socket from Blender 4.2. And uh, we can use this now to transform this uh, grid. So we have like a nice scaling and uh, transform operation for the, uh, for the grid node. Let me add back this transform geometry node. And then change this to matrix type because I'm just going to control the um, the the, mat the transform matrix going into this by using a combine transform node and then connect it to both and there we go. It's as simple as that. There's one thing one thing to say about uh, <coughs> about this the orientation of the gizmo no matter of what you plug in here is going to be dependent on the these settings here in the viewport just like you have it also for the uh, object mode uh, when you're manipulating objects so even if you uh, control specifically if i use a separate node separate transform so if i plug that in here to make sure that the gizmo is in the right place it will, oh. The orientation will still depend on the setting. So I have it to global now. If I switch to local, it uh, switches like this. But if you're paying attention, you've noticed that these arrows are in the wrong place now. So we've transformed the plane after we uh, added these or controlled these gizmos here, but there's no real knowledge of the node system that it also needs to transform the gizmo so you can still interact with them. And uh, for that, we just need to let Blender know, hey, these gizmos belong to this geometry coming out of the plane, because right now they're not attached at all. They're just implicitly attached by these values. And there's an easy way to fix this. And that's where the transform output of the gizmos comes into play. We just add a couple of join nodes and then join together the transform outputs of all of these gizmos and then join them into the uh, the geometry data flow of the grid that we're using. And you can see it immediately snaps to the correct place. And then no matter what the transformation is that we do after, Blender corrects for these changes to adjust how the gizmo is displayed and uh, propagated back. So now this works again. And then ideally we should do the same also with the transform gizmo here to make sure that any other operations that we do later down the road uh, also propagate the transformation back. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much the main setup here for this little, uh, this little grid plane. Now I want to turn this into an asset where people can actually use the gizmos. Because right now we've always just been working with the nodes, but if I just want to drop this into a file with the gizmos as an asset that I can just use in the viewport, you can see if I go back here, the gizmos don't actually show up. And the reason for that is that the, the reason why the gizmos showed before was that we have had a viewport open. But if we want to actually expose this as an input to the, uh, to the asset, we need to expose it on a modifier level. So we need to make actual inputs from these uh, nodes that we've made. So on the group input, I'm just gonna add an input socket for the size X. And then the same thing 
equals size y. Reshuffle this a bit and then just connect those instead of the value that we had. I think right now they're probably zero, which is not great. Yeah. Let's use two. And then connect this. Can get rid of that one. Connect this. And now these are actually settings of the modifier. So they're not stored in the node tree anymore. They're passed into the node tree from the modifier level. And that's also why now we can see them here in the 3D viewport, even though we don't even have a node editor open because they're not interaction with the node tree anymore, their interaction with the modifier interface, and that's how they're exposed. So we can actually use them like this now. And if you want to uh, ship your asset with gizmos, now this is the way to do it, to expose it to the modifier level, and then people can just drag and drop the asset into the viewport, and uh, yeah, it will just work like this. Okay, I could spend a little bit more time def uh, refining this, but I think the, the gist is all there. So this is like this little uh, asset setup. Let me go over some other things. So that's mainly the gizmo part. Let's talk about some other new features of uh, Blender 4.3. Where am I? Right, there's nothing here because I need to start from scratch. <laughs> So we're gonna use this little uh, birch tree asset that I showed earlier with the predefined gizmos. And we're gonna make a little asset library out of those. So the idea is to create something like, uh, like this. This is another tree asset that I created earlier. And if I go just to the full viewport, you can see that when this is selected, based on the context, it shows the gizmos that come alongside this asset. And uh, these here are to define a library of trees that are all randomly changed. So we have a procedural asset, which is this little tree, just like the birch one that I showed. And uh, depending on these gizmos, we can create a certain size of library that has random variations. And then there's some other some other gizmos to just change the shape of that. So let's create this kind of thing for the birch asset as well. So one thing that I already prepared for this, because I don't want to really talk about gizmos right now anymore, is a point grid group node, which just comes with the gizmos already need to find it in the viewport if I take a, if I connect it to the output you can see well it's just points so we can't really see much but um, but there's the gizmos already to control ah there we go there's the points a little bit far away right now there we go so this node group just gives us a bunch of points that we can use to generate the assets on and then we can control the amount and uh, how wide everything is and so on. So this node group just comes with the gizmos predefined. But now the thing that I want to use, which is uh, another exciting new feature in Blender 4.3 for geometry nodes, is the for each, it's a long name, for each geometry element <coughs> zone. So. Yes, this is a for loop. We already had the repeat zone, but it works a bit differently. So the idea with the repeat zone, which is also a for loop, is more that it just chains together a bunch of operations in a serial manner. So they are just executed one by one after the other. So if I change this iterations count up and add a transform node, for example, it will just transform whatever I pass in here however many times uh, by the inputs that I plug in here. This loop works a bit differently. 
it's more rather than serial, you can think about it as more something uh, parallel. So it can also make use of parallelization. Uh, and what it means is that basically whatever we put into this uh, zone here is going to be executed once for each element of the geometry that we pass in. So when I take this point grid, pass it in here, while this is set to the point domain, whatever I do in the zone is going to be done once for each point of this geometry, which is exactly what I want. So if I, uh, so if I, for example, just create a cube in here and pass it to this output, I'll go over that a little bit in a while. It's going to create a whole bunch of cubes, which right now are all in the same place. So it doesn't really tell you much, but, uh, let me go to the spreadsheet and here you can see there's not actually just one cube, it's a bunch of cubes. So how do I get these into the position of the point grid that I uh, created before? So to get information about the, uh, the element that I'm iterating over, the best way is to pass in the attribute from the outside which I can just get with the position uh, field and pass it in as an input. And you can see already, uh, if you're familiar with geometry nodes, this represents a field, so this can be different for each element of the evaluation on the geometry. But then in here we have a round socket which, which signifies that this is a single value. So inside of the context of this zone here, because we're iterating over the individual elements, rather than an attribute, we get a single value, which is the singular position of the current point that we're looking at. Because everything in here is done for each element. So we can look at one element as uh, its own thing. And that means we can use a transform node, which usually doesn't, it doesn't take uh, fields as an input because it's just a singular transformation. But we can now take the position of each point as a singular vector for the translation of the transform node. And now we can see how it actually uh, sets all of these cubes on the right spot for all of the points that we pa uh, pass in. So this allows a new kind of workflow that hasn't really been possible before. So this kind of a thing that I'm building here would have been a lot more difficult to achieve before with some hacky workarounds. And uh, now it's actually very efficient because of the way it's implemented with the parallel loops. Uh, let me go over very quickly about. How do you get the point grid node at the end of the So the point grid node is something that I already stored in this file. I just oh, created it's it. Not there as a regular node. Uh, no, it's not there as a regular node. Uh, you can also. So this is basically just a glorified grid node, more or less. You can also just use a grid, pass that in, and then uh, do a similar kind of thing. It just has different controls. And as you can see, it doesn't adjust for the size. So I just made something that is a bit more convenient for the kind of asset library workflow. It's not a huge node tree. The, the biggest part is here, the gizmo is actually to make the logic work properly. The rest is relatively simple. Um, right. So let me, because I kind of glossed over it, go a little bit over the different inputs and outputs of these nodes. So I already mentioned that here in the for each element uh, input node, we have the geometry that we pass in, and then we can also pass in a selection. So we can basically mask which of the elements we actually want to iterate over, to not do it over all of them. And uh, then we can pass in attributes to be evaluated as single values on the inside. Uh, we also get the index of each element in here, so we can do more processing based on that and the element itself, which depending on the domain type might make more or less sense. But because a single point that was previously attached on a plane doesn't really make sense if you just rip it out. So it's going to be a new geometry that's just that point. Uh, so for face corners, for example, that doesn't make any sense. You can't just have a face corner be its own geometry. Uh, so for that, it's not supported. But for other things like a spline, for example, it makes perfect sense to just look at each individual spline and then I get the geometry of that spline as the element. And then in the outputs, 
it gets a bit more interesting. So we have already predefined when you add this zone, two sets of outputs. There's the, the main outputs here up there, and then the uh, a panel with generated outputs. And the difference between those is that the main output is basically just the input geometry. So I can look at the points uh, processed by this zone. And then you can attach additional attributes to it. So for example, let me just connect the position, which inside of this zone is just a single value or a single vector. Uh, outside, it's an attribute again, because this has basically the uh, inverse logic of separating the attribute into individual uh, values inside of the zone and then combining them back later as an attribute. So this is a very uh, convenient way of working with uh, individual values for each iteration and then turning them into an attribute that you can process later. So here, the position is just the position again. But in a lot of cases, you're probably not even going to need this top part of the node. What you're actually going to want to use is the uh, generated panel. Uh, in this case, that's the only one we're going to use because that's where we can take generated geometry from each iteration and then join it all together in one output geometry. So here we're going to get one cube per iteration and then pass that out as a whole set of cubes in one geometry. And uh, these additional sockets are also for uh, attributes that you might want to attach to the generated geometry to pass out as a field in the end. Or you might want to process uh, different sets of geometry. So maybe we want cubes, but also, uh, but also some spheres. And then you can have different sets of geometry plus attributes as your output, which is all then joined together in these individual geometry sockets. I forgot the most important thing to plug in my uh, laptop. All right. Um, okay, let me undo a couple of steps. So to continue with this setup, because we wanted to actually build a little library of, uh, of birches, let's take the, uh, the birch node group that I showed you as the asset before. It's just this little guy here. We have some, uh, some inputs. And if I just look at the result, it just gives me one, one birch tree with a bunch of different parameters and, uh, if I click on it here, you can see that the gizmos that I saw earlier are right there, depending on if I uh, have it selected right now or if I want to pin it like this. And this is kind of a prime example of using the for each element zone because this is kind of a black box. It just generate, uh, generates geometry once. Uh, so we can't really uh, be smart about generating multiple at the same time because this is just a node group. Um, but in, in reality, a lot of operations where you might think, oh, I can use the for each element zone here. Uh, you don't actually have to. And in most of those cases, it's going to be a lot more efficient if you don't. So uh, some operations are just uh, a lot more optimized if you just use a node that already exists in Blender for it than trying to rebuild it with this kind of zone because it is still a for loop. So it needs to do a bunch of different things multiple times and can't really make uh, use of acceleration structures that are already implemented in Blender. So usually try to not rely on this node if you uh, don't have to. But in some cases you have to, like this one, for example, is a prime example. Uh, we only have this node that does something once, but we want to do it for each point. Transform like we did before. And if I now connect the viewer to this output, you can see there's a bunch of birches. If I click on this again, we get the gizmo so we can spread them out a little bit more. But now they're all the same. What I want to do is randomize them a little bit. 
so each one has a slight random variation based on the inputs that we can change. So I'll just take a random value node and then connect that to, for example, the branch start. Oh, right. So there's a red line. The reason for that is that we, uh, we're getting a field, but inside of here, this needs to be a single value. And the reason for that is that the ID is a field. You can see it's based on the index. But inside of the zone where we are evaluating this, uh, this node group here, it needs to be a single value. So we can just take the current index and slap it in there. And then we can change the settings around to get some variation. And uh, yeah, basically can do the same thing for a bunch of these different inputs. So for the height, to connect the index to the ID again. But in this case, maybe I want to keep the gizmo control uh, so I can interact with the whole library at once in the viewport. Uh, one thing I can do for that is instead of directly driving the thing that was previously driven by a gizmo uh, with just a random value, is I can instead use a multiply node and then multiply a value that I'm just creating as a node maybe not go for zero, but for something like 10, with uh, the random value that, let's say, is going to be between 0 0.2 and 1 or something. And then we get kind of the same result, but now we're controlling it with this value here rather than directly with the uh, random value node. And that means we can have a gizmo. So uh, right now, this is not working in this context, but if you go into the uh, node group, nope. ah, this used to work. Okay, uh, that's a bit unfortunate. <laughs> Okay, I'm not entirely sure why this isn't working. Sorry about that. Uh, but you should be able to see the gizmos. I mean, this is still the pre-release version, so hopefully we can take a look at that and then uh, make sure that things show up in the right place. But it's not that crucial for this demonstration anyways. Uh, but the idea is that then we can randomize these individual inputs inside of the, the loop to get a bunch of different random variations. And of course, most importantly, what I forgot to randomize is the, the seed. So we get a truly different variation. And that one I'm just going to expose as a group input. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I need to use the single value of the index, but to get control over it, I can add the value to it that I can control from the uh, from the modifier input. So let's use the add node, connect that here. And now we can change the seed from the outside while still getting a different result for each iteration that this runs. So now let me do a couple of more additional things, not too many because we're running out of time. But uh, another thing I want to to do, which is another new feature in uh, Blender 4.3, is to name the geometry that I'm generating. So each little tree is going to have its own individual name. And for that, there's the set geometry name node. And the name that we're setting this to, which is just a single string, it's not a field, it's not an attribute, but inside of the zone, it doesn't matter. We can change it for each iteration. So 
let me just take a string node. I'm gonna call this birch. And now they're all called birch, which is not a very unique name. But, one second. But it already shows up here in the spreadsheet, which is another new thing. Now that we can actually name and organize geometry sets a bit better, we have a list of the uh, geometry sets that are part of the geometry we're currently inspecting. And then we already see one problem here. So all of these individual birches are in the same geometry set because that's just how this works. It all packs everything into one thing. But I want the birches to be individual instances of their individual geometry. So what I'm going to add is a geometry to to instance node. And now you can see that there's a whole list of all of these individual birches, which are all their own individual geometry sets. But they all have the same name, uh, which we should change. And for that, we can simply use a join strings node and join the birch string together with the index. Oh, never mind. The index converted to a string. And there we go. Now every birch has their own individual name and we can identify them. While they might not be very creative, at least we can tell them apart. Uh, and you can also notice when I click on these uh, individual geometry sets here that are identified by name, I can inspect their individual geometry in the spreadsheet. So we actually have a way of navigating through layers of instances to inspect the data, uh, which wasn't possible before. So that's another new feature. And let me show another new feature, which is not super crazy, but there's a new integer math node. So we can add one to this and let it start with one instead of zero. Okay, so now that these are instances, individual instances with their own name like this, we can use them to scatter them around in the last little thing I wanted to show uh, to create a little forest. And for that, let me actually just, because we're kind of running out of time, take the nodes I have up here as a backup and connect it. It's nothing crazy. There's just a distribute points on faces node, instance on points to do the scattering, which is like a very basic example of just scattering assets. And then this is the more interesting part. So. I'm passing in the collection with all of the trees, which I have right here. So this tree lib collection contains two objects, the birches and the pines. And those both work the same way as I've shown you uh, with this setup here, by passing out a list of instances of individual tree geometry. But to actually get down from the collection level through the objects to those individual instances um, that we want to use for distribution, we need to uh, realize one level of geometry. This might be a little bit abstract, but we can actually check this, uh, this out in a little bit more detail now if we use the viewer, because now we have this nice little overview in the spreadsheet. So you can look at what the collection info gives me and that's the, the tree lib geometry, which contains geometry from the birches object and the pines object. And then those contain the individual trees. I just want all of the trees in one list. So what I can do is use the realize instances node, toggle off the realize all, because that just realizes everything, and then set the depth to one. And then this way you can basically collapse the top level of geometry all into one. And now we have a list with all of the different trees, the birches and the pines together. Just like this.
And then for scattering, we need to just do one more thing, which is set the position of the instances all to uh, zero to get them back uh, into their original place, which I think I messed up because I need to I need to do the transform operation that I did here in the end when they're already instances. Just a little hiccup. And now if I go back to the view, you can see how everything now is in the origin. And then when I scatter them around, you get this nice little forest. And just from navigating the viewport without any node stuff, we can now click on the individual assets. Oh, I need to expose these. So there's a very quick, just typing in in to search for the group input, and then there we go. And now just clicking on the object, we have the individual controls. And you can see how the, how the forest adjusts in real time. Basically, we can choose our biodiversity however we want. If we want more birches or more, uh, more pines, it adjusts like this. And we can just use the viewports with the gizmos for that. And I'm actually right on time, so that's perfect. Uh, thank you very much. It's time for questions, maybe. Uh, you had a question earlier, right? Oh, I already answered it. It answered? OK, perfect. Yes. Which is more optimal, like the instance on points node or the for each element node? Instance on points, 100%. Yes. Um, that way around, not really, because then you can't really, right. So the question was, uh, could you do the same thing that I did now with the for each, uh, node with, uh, it just instancing you could in theory, but then you need to work on all of them in parallel, which would mean I need to adjust the way that the node group works because the node group only just does one. It can't do multiple at a time. You could do it in a way that it does multiple at a time, but that would mean I need to go into the node group that already exists and change it. So this is a nice convenient way of working with like a black box like that without having to go into it and change it. Even though it could be more efficient by doing it another way, you definitely get a, a lot more creative flexibility by just doing it the su uh, simple stupid way which works and it works well enough. So definitely, yeah. Uh, the question is to combine uh, USD and geometry nodes more. I mean, there's development going on for more integration of USD in general. I mean, it's a bit off topic here, but uh, I, I don't have like a specific answer for that. Obviously, we know that USD is a popular uh, format to, uh, to adopt more and more in pipelines. So we're looking into that, but uh, there's nothing specific I can talk about. Question. Yeah. Right, so if I understand the question correctly, it's like how is determined what is actually being changed by the back propagation? Yes. So the, uh, the way that works, and it can be a little bit more intelligent in the future potentially, but the way that works is any operation that can logically be reversed, because that's what the system needs to do, like adding can be very easily be reversed by just subtracting. Uh, some other things can not easily be reversed, so those cannot actually be back propagated. And it's always only going to be the first input of the node. So if you have an add node, it's going to affect backwards the first input, not the second one. That's how it works. Uh, yeah? I'm just going back to an earlier question. Presumably, once you're happy with the tree, like the tree that you made, you can just add another node to that tree. Is that correct? Will, will the gizmos propagate? No, so, if, so let's say you're happy with the birch library. Yeah. If you apply the modifier, it comes down to just an object. Will it still propagate into the scattering correctly? Uh, so right now you cannot in Blender apply 
geometry that contains instances in a way that it contains the instances. Hopefully in the future that will be possible, but right now that's not a thing. Uh, and I think that has to be it because I'm already a little bit over time. So thank you very much. You can hunt me down later if you have more questions. <laughs>